All right, we don't want to delay it too, too long. Um, if anyone else pops in, you know, we have the chat, we can always discuss. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, on behalf of President Karsten and the Stanner Alumni Center, we are so excited to welcome you to our networking panel, Navigating the Job Market Part Two. We have an amazing group of young alumni professionals here, six different people from a variety of backgrounds and class years. Um, and we're so excited to be able to have some discussions about navigating the job market in these crazy times that we're living in and best practices, advice, tips, you know, tricks of the trade, things like that. My name is Rebecca Wagner. I'm an alumni development officer at Malloy. I come from a background in a variety of different fields. I worked in admissions, I worked in television, now I'm here at Malloy in the alumni office, started at the end of 2021, excited to be able to do a lot of engagement and work with you know, many of you alums from all over. Um, and like I said, with us, we have six panelists tonight. I'm gonna let them take just a moment to introduce themselves. So we'll start with Fabio, feel free, uh, tell everyone who you are, give a wave, and then we'll get through our introductions. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Fabio Estrada, Archbishop Malloy class of 2018. I currently uh, attend St. John's University, graduating in May, and I'm tentatively scheduled to join the Defense Intelligence Agency in May. I'm um, happy to be here. Hey everyone, I'm Eva Lee. I'm also class of 2018. I'm now a senior at Fordham University and I'm majoring in finance. And after this semester, I'll be working at Credit Suisse for sales and trading. Hi everyone, um, I'm Alexandra Sanulis, also class of 2018. Um, I'm currently a senior at Baruch majoring in finance and I just started working in commercial real estate. Hello, I'm uh, Ryan Karsten. I graduated Malloy in 2013. I went to uh, University of Delaware for civil engineering and graduated in 2017. And I work as a uh, civil engineer for Turner Construction. One sec, Jack. I think you got to unmute. I do that a hundred times a day. There we go. Um, glad to be the first one to get that out of the way. Uh, I'm Jack Mang, you know, saying uh, Malloy class of 2016 after Malloy went to college at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, studied business and economics there, graduated in 2020. And now I work for Bain and Company, which is a management consulting firm where I'm an associate. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kate Mulvihill, Archbishop Malloy class of 2011. Um, I graduated from Providence College in 2015 with an accounting degree, and I'm currently the Senior Manager of Financial Reporting at Blue Apron and also a Certified Public Accountant. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for introducing themselves. You reminded me, I didn't say my class here. I'm a class of 2014 grad, so I fall kind of right in the middle um, with Ryan and this group of, of uh, alums we got here. Now we did receive some questions ahead of time and to give you a little bit of a heads up to the flow of what we plan for this evening, we're going to answer all these questions that we you know received ahead of time and then we'll open it up to a live Q&A. So we ask that for right now, you stay muted, you you know, be able to hear some of these great questions and the discussions and the feedback. And then when we're done, we'll open it up to any live questions you might have, whether you want to type it in the chat or you would like to unmute and ask them. That's what our panelists are here for. If, you know, by the end of this session, we don't have time to answer all the questions, you feel free to email me. I'll be putting my email in the chat at the end of the event. So we'll be able to, you know, send the questions to the panelists, and then I'll provide those responses to you via email in, in the week following. So we will have plenty of time to answer all of the questions. So let's jump in. We're here to talk about navigating the job market, best practices, networking, all the important things to help you be successful in your professional careers. And we'll start with Fabio, um, you know, your specific area, Homeland Security, the stuff that you're doing, it's very niche. So a main question would be, how do you make connections in such a specific job field and how do you find opportunities? Did you know that you wanted to do something like that? And, and what kind of help did you get? So really tell us all about that. Right. So I think from a young age, I had a passion in uh, a federal law enforcement 
um, career since I was very, very young. I, since like five, since I can remember. But um, when I got older, I was introduced to people in this profession, 13, 14 years old. And uh, it's kind of understanding what they did and what, how they came about it. So I wasn't really aware of all those things coming, coming out of the gate. Um, so for me, finding those people is key and finding those people that are aware of, uh, how to put yourself in the right environment and how to, how to uh, properly manage what you want to do and how you want to do it is, is key in doing it. And then lastly, it's just, uh, trying to put yourself, uh, out there, right? I think when I joined ICE, the th the main thing they said to me was apply to everything, right? Anything and anything to get your foot in the door and learn. And so I think that's another key a uh, piece of advice I would give to anyone in any field, but uh, particularly in Homeland Security, is just uh, get your foot in the door. It's a very hard place to get your foot in the door, but once you do, uh, it's it's easy gliding from there. Yeah, and would you say that, you know, there's never a time that's too early to start when you want something so specific, you know? It definitely, it, it is definitely hard to start early because a lot of people, it's, it's the experience that they're looking for. But uh, in, co in contrast to that, uh, coming from experience, there comes that, that ability to, uh, that interest, right? Interest before experience. So as long as you have an interest in a certain field or a certain uh, niche part of Homeland Security, let's say, I think you have uh, a right direction. Awesome. Absolutely. Would anyone else like to comment maybe how you got your start in your intended field or your intended area of study? Like what prompted you? What helped you in that process? Yeah, I could jump in um, a way like when I went to Fordham, I when I uh, just got to Fordham, I came in as an econ major. Um, and from there, I kind of just, you know, I hit the ground running and I joined a whole bunch of clubs on campus. Um, there was one particular club uh, on campus that just like taught, you know, everyone about finance. And that's what really sparked my interest at first. And that was my first semester of freshman year. So from there, by just like getting involved and, you know, like talking to people, that's how I kind of figured out where my interests like laid. And, um, you know, like it helped me figure out what I wanted to do. And just by talking to people, networking, that's how I kind of was able to really navigate everything um, similar to what Fabio said, you know, like it's important to just really know what your interests are. And then from there, you can just go and build like your skills for it. Yeah. Definitely, it's important, I would say, from, from everyone in this group, pursuing your passion, because, you know, you come in econ, you might not know exactly what you want, but if you follow what your interests, you know, where your heart lies, you'll find the jobs, the internships, the things that are really important to you. That's, that's awesome. Thanks, guys, for that feedback. Now, Eva, we're going to jump, we're going to piggyback off of that. You came in econ, your finance, you're going to be working, you know, in, in those areas by the time you graduate. How important are experiences, whether they're paid employment or otherwise, and, and what would you most strongly recommend in terms of internships or, or volunteer work? You know, what skills are important? Do they impact your ability to find a job? Yeah, I think starting out, it's, you know, it's hard to get a job on Wall Street your freshman year of college. Like, it's almost unheard of. So for any experience that you get, whether it be like, for example, if you want to do something within finance that has to deal with relationships, and a lot of jobs have to deal with relationships, you can easily get a job, say like at a, at a grocery store or like um, as a cashier or anything like that. And you can take those skills of just relationship building and translate that into a role within finance by, you know, like playing on those relationship uh, client or like client aspects. Um, and then in terms of just, you know, like qualitative or quantitative skills, a lot is learned on the job. But like we said earlier, it's important to just express interest. Um, and, you know, if you can't get an internship during your time at college, that's what a lot of the clubs on campus are for. They're there for you to like really just learn about um, the different job opportunities there are. I know a lot of clubs at my school just inv invites a whole bunch of alumni back. Um, and that's sort of how I learned how to navigate the whole industry as a whole. And I really utilized the seniors on campus and started to network with them. Um, in reality, it's like networking never ends. And that's how I got most of my internships. Um, I just kind of made sure, you know, like people knew who I was. Um, even if I didn't have the, the most experience, people knew that I was interested and willing to work hard. Yeah, absolutely. And then specifically for finance, a question that was asked was, what skills or jobs are would be good for resume builders? So obviously you're, you're still a senior, 
you're going to be starting your job, but in your experience and what you've seen, do, can you identify maybe just a few skills or experiences that you think are, are, are so useful and helpful in that field? Yeah, I think it definitely does vary. Finance is a very broad major. Um, but say if you want to do something more qualitative, um, uh, you could you should definitely you know be able to play on the relationship aspect, whether being having like more quantitative skills. Those quantitative skills could be used for like building models and like investment banking or private equity. Um, client relationships could be more for like a sales role where it's very client interactive. Um, so you know if you're someone that's extremely personable, outgoing. Um, and like willing to just, um, you know, use your voice and be able to speak and with, with confidence, um, then that you should definitely lean towards more like client facing roles. If you're someone that's a little more introverted, maybe like lean towards some research roles or um, some less client facing roles. So there's a spot for everyone in finance. Um, and it's just a matter of getting to know yourself and getting to know the different types of jobs that are out there. Absolutely. No, well said. Thank you. I'll even pose this question to the other panelists here tonight. Are there any skills that you've learned uh, or, or created and, and built and you know, fostered in each of your job fields that you think are just important in general for anyone who's trying to navigate the job market? Um, I'll take a stab at that due to the fact that mine is a little bit more, um, like you said, niche. It, it is going into the field where I'm, me, myself, I'm very uh, like personal kind of uh, guy. So going into that field, it's a very um, serious, uh, right? You go into a, a conversation like this, everyone is like a general or a um, senior analyst in the CIA, the DIA, the FBI, this and that, right? So you kind of put yourself in a position where like, all right, now I have to understand how to uh, position myself along these people who have so many accolades and so many different uh, places. So I think understanding the difference between the two is a serious uh, um, personality trait to build on. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, uh, I also agree that what, like what Eva said, you know, just learning how to uh, communicate well with others. I mean, it's in, in any job, whether it's how to listen to somebody, how to understand their wants and needs. Uh, you know, that's an important lesson to learn and is, is important in uh, every job. No, absolutely. I mean, even in my own career, I think one of the skills I've always been someone I like to think who's outgoing and talks to everyone, not everyone's like that. And you have to play your strengths and understand really where those lie and where you can, you know, make the most of them be the most fruitful. So that's some great feedback, guys. We really love it. Now, Alexandra, you technically have a background in finance, but real estate as well. Um, and I think the group might not know this, but first I would ask to tell them how you got this job that you're already working as a second semester senior, um, and then really talk about the importance of how you got there and, you know, internships and things like that. I think it would be great for them to, to get a sense of how you got where you are. Yeah. So, um, I am a senior at Baruch, um, and over the summer I interned at Jones Lang LaSalle, which is a big commercial real estate company. And when I was, a, I remember applying to internships at this time last year, and I was freaking out because, I was applying to everything I saw. I didn't really know what I wanted, but I knew it was my junior summer going to college and I had to get an internship. And I knew I wanted to do real estate, but a lot of, I, I hadn't really experienced a lot of big corporate real estate companies. So when I saw the posting for this job, I knew it was perfect for me. And they knew, I mean, off of a 10 minute phone call, they, they hired me. So they knew I was a good fit for them. And um, over the summer, I was there. And obviously, with commercial real estate in Manhattan, it was a very quiet summer. It was not typical. Um, I came in at a weird time. Not everybody was in the office. And I really just had to make the most of who was there, who I can make connections with. Um, everyone was really welcoming, really nice. And I made a lot of relationships. And when I realized that the summer was coming to a close, and I only had a few weeks left there were still people on my team that I hadn't even gotten to really interact with yet. So I sent out an email to my whole team. I said, if there's anything I can do to help everyone, I want to make the most of the rest of my time here. 
And I mean, the whole time I never wanted to leave because I knew I was going to be in at Baroque in the city. So I kind of started asking around um, if they would ever let interns stay if they went to school in the city. But that's kind of like not a common thing. A lot of the interns were from all over the place. So they were like, I don't know, like it's never happened before. And I was like, what's the harm in asking? So I decided to ask. They said they they did tell me that it's not something they usually do but that they would ask. And then I kept waiting, waiting to hear back. Like it was like literally almost the last week of the internship. And then they finally told me that I could stay for the rest of the year, which was like really the rest of the fall semester. And so I didn't really know what was going to happen after that, but I was okay with that for now. I was going to see how it went. And then a couple of weeks after it got extended, um, someone on my team was looking to hire someone. And since I was there, I was in the right place at the right time. They interviewed me on the spot. I had no idea they were even looking for someone. And then I ended up starting to work, transition to work with them as an intern. And now that I'm only in two classes this semester, they let me start full time. So which it's always hard when I'm networking, meeting people, explaining when they say, where'd you go to school? And I'm like, I don't know if I should get into this right now, but I'm kind of still in school. Yeah. Um, sometimes I try. I Sometimes I just say, oh, I went to Baruch because it's just too much to get into it's like such a niche situation to be in, but um, just some of the advice I would have to be in an internship is take initiative. Um, I know it's like scary to be an intern and it's hard. It's, it's nerve wracking to have to approach people and you feel like you're just the intern and no one really wants to help you. But in reality, everybody wants to help you. You're there for a reason and it's to learn. And if people can help you learn and make the most of your experience, they're going to. And that's something that you'll learn over time. Like in the beginning, it's, it takes a little while to get used to. Um, I am a little more outgoing than some people, which is also why I was able to build the connections pretty um, quickly over the summer, which was great. Um, Another tip I have, well, on top of that, just balancing school and work. Like last semester I was in four classes and it was a lot to balance everything. Um, and I was, I had full flexibility cause I was still an intern. So if I needed to leave and go study, I was able to, but I was so interested in what I was doing that I would kind of like be okay with knowing I was going to go home and do homework until I went to bed because I was like, I'll, this is just a couple of months. I want to make the most I can and like learn as much as I can now while I'm still an intern, because once I, I knew, I knew once I started full time, it was going to be, I didn't really have the flexibility to jump around to different groups and see what everyone's working on. And so I took advantage of that and I got to learn a lot of everyone's working styles and I'm really thankful for the experience I had. Um, so my biggest piece of advice would be don't let anyone tell you that it's not going to work out. Don't ask. I, my biggest advice is to ask, oh, there, it doesn't hurt. See, see where it takes you. People respect it so much when you take initiative and you put yourself in the situation that you want to be in and people notice that. Absolutely. I mean, maybe some of our other panelists can even comment on it. It doesn't have to be an internship asking to stay longer, but anything in a job that you're in, whether it's a promotion, a raise, more responsibility because you want to challenge yourself. I think those things are what help you stand out in whatever your chosen field is and someone knows they can count on you, they can rely on you. The the, the ask is the most important thing because what, what are they gonna say, no? And then they'll remember you next time and say, yeah, she wanted to take on this, you know, let's, let's, let's work with her. So I think that's really important. Have any of our panelists feel like they've seen that um, in their own job experiences um, or even just in school where, you know, maybe you made an ask or you saw someone make an ask in some way, shape or form? And it's okay if not, everyone has a different experience. Um, Yeah, Christopher, hi there, welcome. Hey, thanks so much, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, um, I was gonna echo something that Alexandra said earlier. Um, I recently hired two interns and the way they found me was through LinkedIn. So um, one of them, actually three interns now, one of them introduced themselves saying, hey, I, I read about something you posted, I'm interested in learning more. Um, would you have time for a phone call? They had a phone call and then they told me what they wanted. And I was like, sure. Can you start, you know, next week? 
Uh, the other one came down from Buffalo, and then the other one is actually uh, um, was a high school student, high school senior going to college next year. And um, I met his mother, and she basically asked, "Hey, can you can you can you intern for your firm in the summer?" And I was like, "Sure." So basically, the the point of that is, in all three of those scenarios, they reached out to me. They showed the initiative, the interest, um, at least the aptitude to understand what was going on, and that's all it really took uh, was a little bit of uh, effort. Um, and I think that's available. Look, I, I'm happy to have the interns here. So I think it's uh, it's available more than you realize. I think that business owners that are busy or have businesses, it's not a big lift or burden for them to hire an intern. It's more like finding an intern that would want to do some work. So, and the ones yeah, that reach exactly. out to are usually the ones that the ones that actually want to do some work. So I would say all of you should join LinkedIn and start growing your professional network there. Cause that's for me, at least that's where all my professional relationships tend to connect. Absolutely. Thanks for the feedback. And I think social media, LinkedIn, there are so many ways to connect now that to reach out, it's so easy, you know, to, to put yourself out there in a lot of ways. So everyone, thank you for the feedback. This is great. I'm going to throw it to Ryan now. So you're our only, let's say, STEM guy on the panel here for the most part um, in engineering. Um, was that something that you knew you wanted to do? And how did you break into that field after graduation? And really, what worked for you in terms of finding job opportunities in that field? Right. So um, I went to Delaware for civil engineering. Um, when I was in high school, I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know what en any engineering was really. Um, I just knew that I was strong, strong basis in math and the physics. So I should do that. Um, but there's, you can do anything with an engineering degree. You can go to business, you can do finance, you can uh, you know, do whatever uh, you please. Um, specifically with me, there was a, it's usually a choice with civil engineers, whether you go into design or construction management. Um, so I went into the construction management route, which is, um, you know, I work for Turner Construction. It's a general contractor. We oversee I don't know, international company, $10 billion uh, of construction a year. Um, you know, big company. Um, and then, you know, that goes into your next question, how to find opportunities within your company. Um, so, what would you say? Oh, how did I get jumped? Um, so after I graduated, I applied to a bunch of uh, construction firms, a bunch of engineering firms. Um, I ended up getting a job at Turner. There was a, a Malloy alum who worked there, um, who I had contacted, used my Malloy network. Um, and I got an internship there. I worked for a couple of summers and then they, they asked me to come back uh, full time. So I would say, again, throw it, throw it to the wind. Like uh, Fabio said, you know, apply to as many places as you can. Um, yeah. No, that's great. And I think you make a great point, Ryan, that obviously Fabio, Alexandra, Eva, they've all mentioned some important points about putting yourself out there, finding your strengths, not being afraid to make the ask. But you also have to understand the networks you can pull from. We're all here tonight. We're all Malloy alums or we know Malloy alums or whatever that might be. When you can reach out to someone and foster a connection based on a, a mutual uh, school that you went to, things like that, it's a great way to connect because Malloy alums want to see Malloy alums prosper. And when you find quality talent, that's irreplaceable. So the fact that Ryan, you were able to say, hey, Malloy alum, can I reach out? this opportunity and they probably saw something in you that said, wow, this guy's great. And I love to see, you know, Malloy keeping that continued legacy of producing quality students. So I think, I think there's trade-offs to both. I think each side is reaping the benefits. It's not just you're getting all the good things. They're getting a quality, you know, employee who's offering so much to the table. So I think in and of itself, you made a great point there about reaching out to people within your network. Um, even Christopher Warren, who was just on with us, you know, he's a class of 96 grad, older alums, younger alums, they all want to connect. We want to see each other succeed. So that's a great point. Thanks, Ryan, for that. Yeah, um, I'll throw it to Jack now. First, Jack, I would love for you to just to explain to the group a little bit more about what you do and also really how you got there 
Um, often we see you know, students go through a more traditional undergrad major to, to within a more traditional job field. You broke that mold and what you're doing is some really interesting stuff. So how you got there, um, what you do, and you know, maybe what helped you get there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can start with the the what I do, which always does seem to be be the question. Um, I work for a management consulting firm, so we our firm has two main lines of business, both around it, uh, sort of business advisory. So on the one hand, we advise corporate management teams on strategy and operational decisions. So that might be, uh, you know, designing near to long-term strategy, figuring out what sort of markets we want to actually be operating in. And once we select those, like how do we win um, as well as more operational decisions? Like, you know, we are having cost problems with one of our main product lines and we're not quite sure what's generating that. We need to figure it out and figure out how to change it and fast. Um, then on the other side of the business, we advise private equity funds as they, we do what's called due diligence on private assets. So, when they're thinking about making an investment in a private company, they'll bring us in and we will sort of evaluate the commercial attractiveness of that company. So if they were to buy them, what, what are the sort of success prospects look like for that company for the impending hold period, you know, the next three to five, maybe seven years. Um, so hopefully that brings a little clarity to what I do in terms of how, in terms of how I got here. Um, so Bain uh, recruited on my campus at UNC. They recruited uh, a small number of schools out of undergrad. Uh, and I was in an undergraduate business program. So honestly, it, it ends up being one of the jobs that like a ton of the business majors apply to, and it becomes a pretty competitive application and hiring process, uh, which I think is where my main point will come in that I applied and right. I, like had the grades, had the resume points from previous internships, et cetera, to sort of qualify and like give myself a good chance at getting an interview and getting the job. But like, yeah, me and kind of everyone else that applied, right? Like pretty much everyone applying had a good enough resume, had good enough grades that like, you know, you could make a case that they should get an interview, that they should get the job. And it ended up, you know, being a few hundred applicants for 10 interview slots. Um, so what really I think was the most important part of like getting the interview and then ultimately landing the job is just building a really strong case for yourself and coming across as like a, a person and not just like another job applicant on paper. I think a lot of people look at the application process and say, right, I have good grades. I have experience at another place I interned. And like, because of that, my resume looks good. So I'm going to submit my resume and hope it goes well. And the truth is like, even if, you know, your resume is great. Like that's often not going to be enough because a person reading it is looking at one piece of paper, trying to decide if they should make like a big decision to have their firm make a big investment in you. Uh, so I think it ends up being very important to find other ways to become, you know, a, a person applying to a job and not just like one more resume and a stack of a hundred. So for me, that was, I knew that Bain recruited on my campus and they did on-campus recruiting events, you know, every single year, usually, you know, two or three times a year. And so as soon as I kind of got an idea that it was a place I'd maybe want to work, which was like sophomore year, I started going to those events and they didn't have an internship program for the summer after sophomore year, but I still went and I introduced myself and I got email addresses and followed up and, you know, took calls with associates that were working there and visiting campus to kind of just ask them some questions about, What's the day to day like? What does the recruiting process look like? Can you connect me with other people at your firm? I'd love to ask more questions. And I think through that process and just being pretty persistent about it, by the time I applied formally my junior year and ended up getting an internship that turned into a full time job, but by the time I applied to that internship, I you know, it was on a first name basis with the recruiter. I knew, you know, five people in the office that I had developed a personal relationship with. And then, you know, when I submit that resume and application, it's not just like, you know, another piece of paper with a random name of someone I've never heard of that has the similar GPA and experiences to everyone else. It's like, oh, I know this person. I know they're interested. I know they can be a good fit. And I think for me, that's what made a big difference. And now being on the other side of it and like helping our, you know, campus recruiting teams getting that view, I think that that's definitely the case, that those people who are actually people and not just faceless applicants 
fair, a much better chance of getting an interview in the job. No, absolutely. How has it been during COVID, you know, being, now that you're assisting with that, but also graduating college, you know, in 2020, do you find it's, it's harder to make yourself stand out to find ways to make yourself stand out when you can't always be in person, for example? I think, yes, I think uh, what I'd say is it, it just requires a much more conscious effort to do it, right? It's very easy when you're working remotely, especially like I started remotely. It's very easy to just kind of get your emails and pings and do the things you're asked of and then, you know, get through your day and sign off. And it requires like making a conscious effort to get FaceTime with people, start to get to know people, find people besides just your immediate team to kind of meet. Uh, I tried to be conscious about doing, you know, one-on-one check-ins with my supervisor and my manager, at least, you know, every other week or every week to just kind of talk about how things were going, get feedback, you know, understand more about the firm and what life is like, you know, what life would be like when we're back in the office and just starting to kind of build some personal connections that are more than just messages back and forth on the computer. And I think that now that we've just recently transitioned uh, to being back in the office, it's made a huge difference in terms of like comfort level and feeling up to speed uh, versus had I just been a lot more passive and like content with the, the virtual setup. Absolutely. I think those are some great tips because people they don't think about that. You're right. When you're working from home or this or that, it's easy just to, like you said, get the email notification, get the ping and maybe not put the face to the name, but you're making yourself stand out when you make those conscious decisions. So Jack, that that's phenomenal. Thank you for that feedback. Um, and lastly, we're going to throw it to Kate, um, your unique perspective. So obviously you're a CPA, you're working for Blue Apron, um, but a part of your job is to interview candidates, correct? Um, and in doing that, I think a great point that we could be able to discuss is what would you say are the interviewing do's and don'ts? Jack was just talking about ways to make yourself stand out, but what would you say is the best, you know, the best path to success when someone is searching for a job and, and finding their place within a company that maybe might have a competitive process or anything like that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. And um, I kind of want to speak to this in two parts um, to kind of round out all of your questions. The first being networking, which is so important. And then the second being my interview do's and don'ts. Um, so starting with networking, um, which is how I got my current job. Um, before that, I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers and my friend Jen from Providence College, where I graduated, had reached out to me about a job opening at Blue Apron when I wasn't actively looking at the time. Um, so Jen and I had stayed in touch after graduation through going to some of Providence's business networking events in the city. Um, and had I not gone there and really put myself out there to talk to her, I would not have known about the job at Blue Apron and my life today would be totally different. Um, so I wanna you know, really encourage everyone, it's so important to attend these networking events or, night like, or nights like this. Um, and most importantly right now in this day and age to uh, keep up with your network digitally. Um, so sending an email or a LinkedIn message can go such a long way um, and it can be simple, but as long as it's intentional, um, I think it will always get across the right way. So you could say something like, you know, how are you doing since we last spoke? Or like, I saw this article or listened to this podcast and I thought of you. Or, or simple things like congratulating someone on LinkedIn about a new job or a work anniversary. Um, just to kind of stay up to date with people in your network and a good rule of thumb for me is really like a touch point twice a year. Um, and really just to highlight that it can be easy when we're on screen all day, um, right? To forget that there are actually other people on the other end of the screen. So uh, a good reminder and for myself included is that no you know, PowerPoint presentation you're working on or Excel spreadsheet can ever replace that personal connection that you develop with someone. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's yeah. so important. And we forget that sometimes, but, you know, mm -hmm. you want to check in. And as much as we say that, you know, oh, it's no big deal. It matters. Like those things then add up and someone thinks of you, oh, you know, Kate, check this out, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's absolutely, you make some great points there. Um, and then your second point would be, do you have any interviewing do's and don'ts or important tips of the trade that you think would be helpful to anyone, whether it's a promotion application, a job application, anything like that. Yes, yes, would love, would love to share. So, you know, 
when you find a job that you want to apply for, um, or even maybe a promotion that you want to ask for, don't worry if you don't check every single box on that job description. Um, so I almost didn't apply to Blue Apron um, because the job description said two to three years of experience, and I was at one year and 10 months of experience. Um, so my first thought was, oh, I'm not qualified for this role. Um, and the reality was, which I, I quickly learned, I was completely qualified. Um, so if you meet at least over 50% of the requirements, absolutely apply. Um, and, and moving on to your resume, um, it's so, so important, I think, to make sure that there are no spelling um, or grammatical errors there. Um, because as a hiring manager, and to kind of piggyback off what Jack was saying, um, I'll quickly read your resume, but a lot of them do look the same. Um, so I'm not going to thoroughly read it through. Um, a red flag would be, again, if there's a spelling or grammatical error. So we'll try and nix that. Um, otherwise, a good resume will get your foot in the door. Um, but ultimately, you are the one, right, who's going to get yourself um, the job. Um, yeah. And you do that, you know, in the interview. So say, you know, you, you apply to the job. Uh, they love your resume. Um, okay, so now the question is, how do you prepare? Um, I always, always suggest researching the company. So look at their website, their recent news, the competitors. Um, if a candidate in an interview were to say to me, um, hey, I just saw the press release that Blue Apron just launched its new heat and eat meals. I think, you know, wow, you know, this candidate really did its research. They really care. Or if they say to me, uh, I looked at your LinkedIn and I saw that you also worked at PwC. Um, I used to work there. Again, I'm thinking, wow, you know, this person cares, right? And now we have this common bond, a common uh, thread to bond over. Um, and once you do do your research, um, you can then think about connecting that into what you can bring to the role. So you can prepare by, you know, thinking about and writing down your strengths, um, your current responsibilities, any stories um, that highlight how your unique skills and experiences will add value now to the role you're applying for. Um, and when you're preparing, always have questions that you wanna ask your interviewer. Um, if a candidate has no questions for me um, about something that they're gonna be doing every single day, uh, that is always a red flag to me, right? I think you have, you have no questions about something that you're signing up for. Um, so, you know, some good examples of questions could be, what does the upward mobility look like in this role? Um, don't be afraid to ask, what does the work-life balance look like? Uh, what is the most rewarding or the most challenging part of the role? Um, and after the interview, send a thank you email. Uh, it goes a long way. Um, we had a situation where we were down to the wire with three candidates and only one had sent a thank you email and that made him stand out amongst the rest. Um, yeah, so above all, believe in yourself and know you got this. Kate, that was amazing. I think there are so many nuances in what you're talking about and there's tips and important things you should be doing at every point in the process, whether you're just starting, you're in the middle, you're on the, the back end of it. And I think that's that's so helpful. So appreciate the feedback from all of our panelists. Now, we do have some time left. Um, does anyone who's here, you know, would you like to, you can unmute and ask a question, you can throw a question in the chat, um, whether it's to one of our panelists directly or just a general question you'd like an answer to, um, we'd be happy to, to go over, you know, anything or or answer any more questions that we're here for. And again, if um, if there's a question that you'd like to ask, but you know you don't want to ask it tonight, you know I just ask that anyone please send me an email. I'll put my email in the chat right before we leave. Uh, send me an email with your questions that our panelists have gladly um, already said that they would look over and provide feedback and responses to. Uh, we do have one more question that I didn't get to ask, but I wanted to see if the group had any um, about a college major. And now I think coming from a background in admissions before working at Malloy, I used to work in college admissions. I think it's a great question. Um, and the person said, should they apply undecided if they're not sure what they wanna do or just pick something and then change when they decide later? Personally, if you're asking me, I think this. Uh, I think the best thing you could do is go in undecided. So many schools nowadays 
they don't care if you're inside. It's not a bad thing. It's not negative. They want to let you come in and figure it out and take the classes and talk to professors. And I think it often helps you figure out what you want to do because maybe like Eva, you switched your major or you come in thinking you want one thing and you realize when you're, you're there or you're at school that you might want something else. And you could take that time to really figure out what you want to do, whether that's finance or engineering, or if you were like me, I was a communication and criminal justice double major. It didn't come in that, um, but I ended up figuring out what my passions were. Anyone else want to comment on that or what, what they think would be best for someone who's at the very beginning of the process looking at college? Yeah, um, I can hop in quick. Similar story to you, Rebecca. I came in uh, undecided and I declared accounting at the end of my um, sophomore year. And, you know, it's hard to know what you want to do when you're when you're coming out of high school and you're just starting college. It's hard to know kind of kind of that route. And like, if you're not sure what your passions are, I think first step is, you know, follow what you're curious about. What do you like? Um, what what does the world need? Um, what are you good at? Um, so kind of follow follow things that you're curious about. And I also think um, as much as you can talk to people who are in the different fields and see what life is like for them, for, um, for them because you're gonna be doing it for a long time. So it'd be helpful to see what life is like every day. Absolutely. Um, and you know, as we come to the close of this panel, as, as we get to the end, I think the most important thing that we've discussed tonight is, is the importance of networking. It never stops. All of our panelists in some way, shape or form have made connections, have talked to people, whether they're people in their chosen fields, whether they're people from the Malloy you know, alumni network, you're never gonna come to a time where networking is a bad thing. And this is a great start. So anyone on this panel, never hesitate to reach out in the alumni office specifically, I'm always there. You know, we have other professionals, our director, um, Craig Katinas, we have President Karsten. We have so many of us who want to see our alums succeed in their chosen fields. And we want to be able to support you and help you make those connections. So first, I encourage anyone, if you have questions in the future, if you need something, our panelists as well, always reach out. We're here for you. We want to support you. Okay. Um, but also don't be afraid to reach out to other people. If you're on LinkedIn one day and you see Eva or Kate or Ryan or Fabio or someone, you say, hey, I attended a panel that you uh, did about a year ago. I, I have a few questions. Most of the time, someone's going to say, yeah, oh my gosh, would love to. How can I help? And then that can spur something down the line as well. Oh, Tyler, I see you have a question. Feel free, go ahead. You can either um, unmute and ask or type it in. Yeah, yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone. Kate, it's really good to see you. It's been uh, it's been a little while. Right? Great to see you, Tyler, love it. Um, yeah, 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 it is. Um, uh, you too, Ryan, it's been a while, uh, too long actually. You know, it feels like it's- uh, yes. How are you doing? Yeah, it's good, good. Things are good here, man. Um, thanks everybody. Seriously. Um, it's nice uh, hearing everybody's story. Um, I, uh, kind of came through this, uh, came to this, like the sort of timing was pretty good. I, like, I have a, a meeting with my, um, somebody on my team who's kind of gotten pretty frustrated, um, in, in her role because, uh, you know, mentioned upward mobility a little while ago and, uh, and yeah, so like it, it's people's stories were pretty helpful and I think they are good things to hold on to certainly anybody could appreciate like kind of like going in the direction of where you're curious or listening and you know kind of under really taking the time to understand needs and and um of the people you're working with and that sort of thing and the dynamics of and all everything that can entail but my question is my question is I'm going off on a, a tangent um people who I think I guess this is for Rebecca and Kate a little bit because you change roles. Rebecca, you said you were in admissions, Kate, you were um, with uh, uh, an accounting firm before this. Mm -hmm. At what point did you feel like, you know, that that you could do this, like that you can make a switch, like the, the year, the two years that you had been working in a previous role, um, that it wasn't right or that something new would be the right choice for you? Kate, do you wanna start? Oh, you could start. Okay, yeah. Well, so um, Tyler, I I've had many career changes. You know, you know how people say um, you have five 
five careers, five jobs before you're 30, right? Our panelists here, maybe Kate obviously had a job prior, but a lot of our panelists are much more streamlined into their career choices. And I think because they had their passions so early, mm. I had passions, but you know, there were so many things I wasn't sure about what I wanted to do. I actually worked in television for a whole year after graduation. I went to the University of Scranton um, and my comm major. So I worked in TV as a production assistant and I liked it, but I didn't love it. And I knew I needed to find something that really was going to capture me. That's when I ended up working as a substitute teacher just in the interim to figure out. And I had a friend similar to Kate's story who was still at Scranton and who called me and they're like, hey, a counselor position's opening up. Um, they are looking for someone to be the Long Island recruiter. And I was like, recruit Long Island? I'm from Queens. I love Scranton. I can get my master's while I'm there. Um, and so they were looking for more, you know, relatively recent grads. So I felt very comfortable going back to Scranton because I knew that that job role was well within my wheelhouse at that point in time. But like you said, coming to Malloy was a very different experience for me because my job is rooted in engagement now, fundraising as I move forward. And I really don't have necessarily the most experience in fundraising. So when I saw on the Beehive that there was a job opening for a development officer, I was just coming to the end of my master's program at Scranton. I love Pennsylvania, but I knew I wanted to come back to New York. A lot of factors were coming into place. I said, oh, I don't know, I'm nervous. Like, I really think I could be a good fit, but will they even consider me? I don't know. And I remember talking to my dad. He's a, a grad from Malloy as well. He's older. He's class 84. No offense if anyone's that, that old as well. And he was like, he was like, just give it a shot. He was like, what are they going to say if you apply? He was like, your personality speaks for yourself. You have a great mm -hmm. work ethic. He was like, there's nothing on this planet you can't learn. And so I remember... Um, sending in my application. And then I reached out to someone at Malloy who I knew. And I said, Hey, I just applied for this job. Um, you know, wanted to chat, do you know more, et cetera. And that was someone actually in the admissions department who was a swim coach. I swam here at Malloy. And then she mentioned my name to someone in, in the alumni office. And I definitely was a dark horse through the entire application process. I didn't maybe have as much fundraising experience as other candidates, but in the end, they chose me based on my interviews and the conversations we had. And I think that that gave me the confidence to be able to go and talk and just show them who I was. But absolutely, Tyler, that's a great question. It can be scary, but you always have to throw your hat in the ring. You know, and I didn't even have as much fun as experience as Kate had experience for the job for Blue Apron. But I was like, you know what? You, you got to try. And now I've been here since the um, end of 2021, like early December. And I'm loving it and I'm learning so much and getting to do things like this to, to engage with alums. So I think that you have to have a little bit, like Kate said, like you have to have just enough of the experience to say like, I think I might be qualified for this, but you don't have to have 100% of all the requirements. You have to have the courage to apply um, and the courage to be yourself and to put yourself out there and to, you know, take no prisoners and to say, listen, I deserve this. Give me a shot. So yeah, I'll, Kate, I don't know if you want to comment anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that, Rebecca. Um, oh, yeah. And just having the courage and talking to people and, and selling yourself. And I, I think it's a great question, Tyler, too. Um, for me, my first job, I, I knew I was, I didn't want to stay there long-term. I didn't see a future there. So when the opportunity arose at Blue Apron, um, it wasn't like hard to walk away from my old job. I knew it was kind of just like a, a a stepping up point for me to start there. Um, and at Blue Apron, why I really felt confident to make the switch was, was the people who interviewed me um, were so smart and so open and so kind and so passionate that I said, you know what, nothing bad can come at, walking, at working side by side with these people. Um, and I had my friend Jen who had worked there and, and she gave me the confidence too that it's a great place to work. Um, and the other part is that I fully believe in the mission of Blue Apron um, and I use the product every single week. Um, so it's fun to work for a place um, with a product I use and, and a company that I believe in. And I believe that we're delivering value to people and I, a, a big foodie. Um, so it was an easy switch for me. And I think, you know, if someone is looking to switch, just know it's, it's never too late. Oh, cool. Thank you both. Um, that was uh... 
you know, it feels like it's it's a little late for the day now, but uh feels like a little bit of a fire is under my butt now. <laughs> It's never too late. It's never too late. I think all these panelists are a great showcase to that. You know, yeah. all the things that they're all doing, they're going out, they're kicking butt and taking names. Okay. So you have a lot of opportunity out there. Now, if anyone has any last questions, feel free to email them to me. Um, let me come right here and make sure I spelled it correctly before I put it in there. But that is my email. Um, anyone feel free to take it, reach out if you have questions. If you prefer a phone call, just shoot me an email. I'll give you my phone number. We can always chat. Whether you want to connect with other alums, you want to connect with someone in our office, you want help with something, we want to help you succeed in what you're doing. Um, our panelists are a great, a great point to that. They're going out and doing things, but I hope they know that they always have us here. Thank you to all the attendees for coming tonight, for listening to us go on for 45 minutes talking about how to best navigate the job market. But you know, also thank you to our panelists for taking the time to do this, to be present, to offer their advice, their, you know, their well thought responses and you know, their conscious answers. So we appreciate that so, so much. I hope everyone stays safe, stays healthy. Spring is coming. It's a beautiful thing. I'm sick of this cold. Have a wonderful evening. And again, if anyone has questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, that's the end of our Navigating the job, you know, the job Market Part 2 panel. So everyone, have a wonderful evening and uh, stay safe now. Thanks, Good night, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Good night, everyone. Bye there. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rebecca.